Hi, people who are just joining us now, we'll just um, wait for a few minutes as people coming in. Um, I'm, I'm Andre Spicer. Um, I hope you're all having a good day. Uh, both David and I, I think have been teaching today, David, is that right? Three hours. Three hours, yeah, I had the four the today. Mere, the mere three hours. Okay, and what was the course you were teaching today, David? It was tutorials in archaeology and anthropology, and the students did these wonderful charts where they have to summarize. This is how cruel I am to my students. Uh, they have a, to summarize visually on one side of A4 the last hundred thousand years of human history with highlights. <laughs> wow! <laughs> they, all come up with, they all come up with amazing different things, and it's always fun to compare students from different, you know, East Asia, the US, or whatever. Um, it's just a little bit of fun for the end of term. That, that's amazing. That's amazing. So. Um, Welcome everyone who's joining us now. Um, I think I'll just uh, briefly introduce as people are joining. So this is David Ingrow, who's um, a professor of um, archaeology at, at UC, uh, University College London at the Institute of Archaeology. Is that correct? That's, yes. that's correct, yes. Yeah, exactly. So he's got a beautiful bookshelf and wooden panels and everything in his office. <laughs> Proper academic office. <laughs> um, and David has... Uh, research and anthropology in a wide range of topics um, and more recently he seems to have got interest in sort of a broader questions of the kind of history, why history of anthropology um, and kind of history of human sort of existence I guess uh, and using that to question some of the kind of deeper myths which we have about human societies um, and I'd, I'd sort of been reading his work over the uh, over the last six months and found it absolutely fascinating not just because it sort of speaks more broadly some of the bigger questions but because um, it also speaks about the kind of questions we're interested in in business schools. Um, so I wonder if uh, and the other thing uh, to note about David is that he has um, been uh, he's, he's just finished completed a book with the late um, who uh, you know very tragically passed away this year um, and and David's and I think Andre's dropped. I don't know if I've dropped. Hello, here is the backup host. <laughs> no, um, you haven't dropped, only Andre has. It happens to him sometimes. So maybe, David, you can kind of finish his thought, which was, I think, about your latest book and your co author. Yeah, well, I'll, I'll mention it briefly as we go along, if that's okay. Um, unless there's something else that you wanted to, to do before I talk. No, I think this is it. Let's hope that Andre comes back because Andre is the one who is properly prepared for this interview and I'm going to be improvising. <laughs> um, so, so I just wanted to tell the audience also, this is unfortunately our last food for thought for this, uh, this year, this calendar year. Um, we think that we will be back next year, but possibly with some hosts uh, to help us out. So please uh, keep... Uh, yeah, we will keep you posted on that, um, what the developments are. Um, and as always, please use the QA function in order to, um, in order to ask us uh, any questions uh, that, that you might have. Um, so David, um, let's start with, uh, with, uh, with this. I don't know whether, whether you agreed with Andre that this would just be a Q&A or whether you would start out by saying something and then turn it into a Q&A. Uh, yeah, probably a bit of both. So I thought I'd, I'd start by, by um actually sharing some uh, reflections on uh, a dinner party. If you remember those, uh, pre-lockdown, uh, I went to- I, I really don't, sadly. <laughs> <laughs> and it turned into one of those slightly heated conversations with my host who, uh, as it happens, a, a trained psychologist, um, but also works as a director in a government department. And he was talking to me about a theory that he came across in a book by Yuval Harari to do with how we're evolved to interact in groups of a certain size and how once groups get above a certain size, one has to have uh, senior managers and directors to uh, manage and direct things and ideally uh, sort of tiered organizations to manage the flow of communication. I don't actually know uh, which book uh, he'd read, um, but it, it provided an explanation about why things always tend to work out that way when large numbers of human beings get together to pursue some kind of common project. 
I suggested to him that um, what he'd read was probably, uh, and I'm only guessing here because I haven't read, uh, read it myself, but was probably citing another uh, theory, which is known as Dunbar's number. And I asked my friend why he found it convincing. Now, I should probably put my cards on the table straight away. I think Dunbar's theory um, personally is a bit like the curate's egg. It's, it's good in parts. Um, and I think it's incomplete uh, in, in others. Um, but anyway, with his um, psychologist's hat on, uh, and also as an experienced line manager in a big organization, uh, my friend reassured me that, that I was the one who was wrong, um, or at least that uh, it would take a lot of counter evidence to uh, persuade him otherwise. And by that time, we had a fair bit of uh, uh, wine. Um, so it's important to be clear about what I think we were actually disagreeing about. Uh, and I think it's also important because uh, it's exactly the kind of conversation that often does crop up uh, time and again. Um, in popular science books of exactly the kind that curious people, including business managers, like to read uh, in their spare time. So um, maybe the easiest way to do this is to basically say what we did agree on about large scale organizations, which really is just um, more or less common sense, but also backed up by a great deal of experimental psychology and behavioral psychology, which is simply the fact that everybody has an optimal threshold for social interaction beyond which things become uncomfortable for them in various ways. So it's also pretty obvious and well documented that that threshold is different for different individuals. You've just got to look at a bunch of kids interacting in the school playgrounds. Uh, some of them are perfectly happy in groups of five, ten or even more uh, uh, um, kids, um, others find that completely overwhelming and will retire to the corner of the ground to just sort of get their heads in order uh, and um, perhaps sort of prefer to hang around the edges of the interaction trying to figure out, you know, when is the best time to, uh, to join the fray. Um, and what I'm talking about there, um, at least partly, uh, is the result of variations in what a cognitive psychologist would call theory of mind the mind's evolved capacity to hold within it a picture of what is going on in other minds which happen to be in its vicinity uh, and to make these incredibly fast predictions, calculations about what those other minds are likely to do next, all based on really tiny cues and all happening at speeds much greater than conscious thought. Now Dunbar's number, uh, which is a theory named after its inventor, the evolutionary psychologist Robin Dunbar, holds that in neurotypical human beings, this theory of mind tends to gravitate around a particular threshold, which places a, a ceiling on the number of stable, trusting relationships one is likely to maintain at any given time, uh, and also on the size of groups. Uh, in which we can function more or less freely without some kind of external hierarchy or management structure. And, and according to Dunbar, that uh, uh, number of relationships is around 150. And he offers a whole explanation in evolutionary terms as to why the ceiling should be located roughly there. This is basically to do with the assumption that for most of human history, our species live predominantly in rather small and isolated groups of hunter-gatherers, uh, with basically extensions of the, uh, the nuclear family. Uh, in fact, on the latest archaeological evidence and also comparative ethnography, uh, that assumption turns out to be quite incomplete, and that's something I've been writing quite a lot about with um, uh, had been meeting with, uh, with uh, my late uh, co-author, David Greber, uh, as you mentioned, Andre, and we can talk more about that uh, afterwards if you like. But actually what I really wanted to draw attention to today uh, is how perfectly reasonable hypothesis about how the human mind or the social brain, as Dunbar calls it, uh, how a hypothesis like that can suddenly morph into a kind of speculation about the course of human history or even the inevitability uh, of uh, certain kinds of um, developments uh, and in particular the various ways in which people are capable of organizing themselves 
into large groups for much projects. Actually, when it comes to speculating about what happens when humans, for whatever reason, do find it necessary to organize in groups much larger than 150, evolutionary psychologists and, and many other people as well often seem to find it difficult to imagine anything other than uh, either a, a, a sort of capitalist business corporation uh, or a nation state or perhaps some combination of the two. Um, and I'd like to take the words direct from, uh, from one of Dunbar's books called uh, Grooming, Gossip and the Evolution of Language. Um, so if it's all right, I'd like to just read you a, a short quote. Uh, so this is Dunbar with um, me interjecting occasionally. Uh, he says, a well-established principle in sociology uh, suggests that social groupings larger than 150 to 200 become increasingly hierarchical in structure. So notice how we've already passed the buck from cognition to sociology. He goes on, small social groups, this is very unfair of me because Robin's not here, but I'll do it anyway. Um, he goes on, small social groups tend to lack structure of any kind, playing instead on personal contacts to oil the wheels of social intercourse. Uh, I don't think that's the case. Um, but he goes on, more people to coordinate, hierarchical structures are required. This is still Dunbar. There must be chiefs to direct, he says, and a police force to ensure that social rules are adhered to. A police force. And this, he says, turns out to be an unwritten rule in modern business organizations too. Notice it's unwritten, so we can't go back and trace its origin. Businesses, he says, with fewer than 150 to 200 people can be organized entirely on informal lines. But larger businesses, says Dunbar, require formal management structures to channel contacts and ensure that each of blood, you get the picture. Now, to be honest, I, this is very similar to what my friend at the dinner party was uh, repeating to me. Um, I, I think there's something slippery about this argument. I mean, where does the buck actually stop with this notion that there is some kind of natural threshold for human social interaction beyond which hierarchy becomes inevitable? Nobody actually seems to want to take any responsibility for it, but almost everybody seems to be quite happy to repeat it uh, on the basis that it must be grounded in some kind of rigorous scientific testing. Now, at some point, David and I actually decided to try and follow the trail of this idea and get where it leads to. Uh, actually, the origin of these ideas and that whole game of passing the buck uh, seems to go back a very long way, all the way back as far as we could tell, to psychological experiments that were done in American business corporations in the 1950s and 60s. And somewhere or other, not today, but I've actually got a list of references that I'm happy to share with anyone who's interested. These studies were published in journals of management theory and journals of industrial psychology. And then they seem to have been picked up and repeated basically by everyone from sociologists to archeologists as if they were fact uh, and with a new scientific sounding name of scalar stress theory, scalar stress theory. And then a new wave of evolutionary psychologists in the 1980s start citing the archeologists and so on and so on, uh, right down to the present day. That's, that was our impression of what's happened. Uh, but the truth actually is that really the whole thing seems to start and end with experiments conducted within the institutional framework of modern business corporations. And this is a key point. These are corporations with a specific objective in mind of enhancing efficiency and productivity and where the existence of managerial ranks, ranks is already taken for granted. They're already there. So basically, I, I, I would uh, go so far as to suggest that what came to be known as scalar stress theory is essentially a kind of mythical charter of origin for the modern business corporation underwritten by the physical force of the state. Remember, those police. 
uh, it's also a great example of how ideas about human evolution can find their way into everyday life. So if you're unhappy uh, about working in a big, very hierarchical organization and you wonder if the same thing might be achieved in a whole number of different ways, you're probably unlikely to get beyond the stage of idle daydreaming because everything you're likely to read suggests that the forces of history and even human evolution will basically push you to smithereens the minute you actually try it. Actually, there probably are a number of things that will crush you, uh, including your boss and, if necessary, those police. Um, but I don't think history and evolution uh, are actually the sort of things you need to worry about. In fact, uh, a lot of what David and I uh, have been working on for some years now is uh, this book, uh, which will be called The Dawn of Everything, which shows, um, among other things, that history and evolution are, are really not what you should be concerned with here if you're looking for alternatives to highly unequal, uh, ranked and stratified ways of organizing things on a large scale. Actually, if anything, history is on your side because it shows, among other things, that actually humans did not spend most of our evolutionary existence in tiny isolated bands of hunter-gatherers, and that actually when we did first scale up to the level of, say, cities or regional confederacies, uh, there was absolutely no need for hierarchical tiers of managers or administrators, let alone uh, police forces or armies. Um, of course, those things did happen sometimes, but actually a surprising number of the world's earliest really large-scale projects, including cities, uh, were organized on quite robustly egalitarian lines with no obvious stratification at all. Um, and I'll just finish with two quick examples. Uh, in Ukraine, about 6,000 years ago, some of the world's first cities emerged with populations in the tens of thousands, but with absolutely no evidence of monumental buildings or centralized administration or even marked differences of wealth. Instead, archaeologists find these circular arrangements of houses, each with an attached garden, forming neighborhoods around assembly halls. So this is an urban pattern of life built and maintained from the bottom up, which lasts in that form for more than 800 years. Now, there's no writing system there, so we've got no way of telling in any great detail how these societies functioned, but experts working in that region currently construct a system that revolved around decision making from the bottom up, starting at the household level, working up to neighborhood councils and assemblies, and eventually the municipal level of the whole city. One more quick example, a much more recent one. Um, this is about Basque communities in the uh, Pyrenees Atlantique of southwest France, uh, which organized societies of many thousands of people, so way above the Dunbar's number uh, sort of level, uh, actually in quite a similar way, also in circular settlements. Uh, I'm not sure what's going on with circles, but it's quite interesting. Um, as a kind of self-conscious egalitarian project where everyone has neighbors to the left and neighbors to the right, no one is first and no one is last. And in both cases, we know that these were in no way symbol societies. Actually, they both maintained very elaborate subsistence economies and regional systems of exchange for raw materials and other kinds of knowledge, often involving really complex logistical challenges like scheduling the uh, agricultural calendar or construction projects that needed hundreds or even thousands of people to get involved with. Um, but they resolved all this through really intricate systems of mutual aid without any need of centralized control or police forces or hierarchies of management and administration. And anyone who's interested can read about this in Sandra Ott's uh, wonderful uh, ethnography, which is called uh, The Circle of Mountains, uh, which is also used as a case study in that wonderful book by Marcia Asher. Uh, about ethno-mathematics called Mathematics Elsewhere, where she goes into this incredibly complex, what she calls a uh, serial model of reciprocity through which these um, sort of egalitarian uh, micro-cities uh, are maintained. Um, 
in words, and this is the basic point that I'll finish on, uh, uh, despite the confident uh, pronouncements of uh, evolutionary psychologists, uh, I don't think these things are inevitable. They're not the result of human evolution. They're the result of choices uh, that we make, uh, which we can therefore unmake uh, about how to organize ourselves and how to do things uh, on a large scale. So if I finish there, uh, I hope that's all right. Um, maybe we can uh, discuss. Can't hear you, Andrew. Um, thank you very much, David. This is absolutely fascinating. And it's just a small slice of a big and fascinating project. And I, I just can't wait to read the book when it comes out. Um, the pieces of it, which I have, I have read, which I think, I mean, which are the sort of articles, I guess, which sort of build up to it that you've done over the, the years, um, raise some really interesting questions. But before, before I ask a question, I just say that if anyone has any questions I'd like to ask, please put it into the um, Q&A function and then I'll put it up and put them to David. But the first question I had, I read one of your articles, which was about, um, I think in the Pacific Northwest of the US, and you point that you get these kind of potlatch economies appearing, but there's a seasonal variation between kind of smaller scale and larger scale society. So it's the same society can move between two very different structures based on the seasons. So we realize that societies don't seem to have one model, but they, I wonder if you'd like to say a little bit about that because that provides us with an interesting alternative too. Yeah, I mean, it's one of those funny things where something that would have been common knowledge and taken for granted by most anthropologists in the early 20th century and in, well into the middle of the 20th century kind of dropped out of the literature was this idea um, and this observation that many hunter-gatherer societies have what Marcel Mauss called a dual or double morphology. Um, and it's very well documented, not just on the uh, Pacific Northwest coast, but among uh, many uh, indigenous and Aboriginal societies in the circumpolar region, uh, in Oceania, Australia, um, is that uh, demographically, groups alternate uh, between quite radically different scales over the course of an annual cycle of hunting and gathering. And when they do so, they also achieve these really remarkable transformations of their political systems, their legal systems, even their systems of morality. So for example, Inuit uh, in the circumpolar region will alternate uh, on an annual basis between um, really very different notions of property relations. Uh, so in the, uh, the summer month when they're split off into rather small hunting groups uh, going after seal uh, on the coast and so on, uh, these are actually very uh, possessive uh, groups where private property is very developed and property is even marked with sort of administrative signs. But then in the long winter months when they congregate uh, in the great winter houses, everything becomes about altruism and reciprocity. And nobody's allowed to keep or hoard anything, including their sexual partners during the feasts of Sedna. You have to share everything. So to talk about them as having a particular society or a particular social structure is really misleading. Um, and, and this is something to the point we made in general about so-called simple societies, actually it seems to be the case, and I think archaeology bears this out as well, as far back as we can go, that uh, our early hunter-gatherer ancestors were in many ways more complex, certainly more experimental than we are uh, in political terms, and would often switch uh, quite routinely between these radically different forms of organization. Hmm. Um, the next question I have is, I don't know how to formulate this correctly, but one of the kind of dominant ideas kind of in anthropology and, and other areas is this idea that as soon as you get grain or rice, then you get these kind of large scale societies with, with hierarchical structures and so on. And I think mm. from my understanding, you've kind of questioned that a bit, the kind of grain hypothesis of the state. Yes, I think there are lots of different grainy, various levels of grainy hypotheses about the state. The one that's probably um, most widely read in recent years is um, Jim Scott's book, uh, which is actually called Against the Grain. I don't know if you've, uh, if you've caught up with that one. Um, 
which managed to offend lots of biologists. It always happens when somebody comes from outside your field and sort of says what sort of thing you probably should have said years ago. Um, but he, he made the argument, I, th I think actually his argument's been very widely misrepresented and, and, and even misunderstood. Um, but he simply makes the point that um, it's very convenient for state-like organizations to have lots of people growing crops because they're easily monitored, they're visible, they're quantifiable, therefore they're very taxable quite apart from creating peasantries and rooting people. I don't have any problem with that particular theory. I think it makes a great deal of sense. What people often seem to um, think he's saying, which I don't think he's saying at all, is that simply the existence of agriculture inevitably leads to that kind of situation, which is simply not the case. For example, the Ukrainian uh, mega sites or early cities that I was talking about, uh, they were cereal farmers. They also did lots of other things, herding, hunting, gathering, collecting. But the fact that they kept, that they raised cereals on a, on a large enough scale to feed thousands and thousands of people did not, uh, in that case, produce anything uh, remotely resembling a state-like uh, organization. So there is no causal relationship uh, between those two things, um, I would say, is um, uh, uh, something that emerges from, from the archaeological evidence. But once those things exist, there's certainly a temptation to uh, push people in that direction. So we have a question here on the chat from Jared Olson. Um, for you, what explains the seeming entrenchment or permanence of hierarchy as we move? Uh, so we have a young visitor here uh, uh, to, to the present and human um, history. Yeah. Can you blow this yeah, sure. It was his fault. Okay. I don't know. Uh, let me see. That's a really complicated question. So I'm going to see if I can read it. Is it in the chat there? Uh, oh no, I've got a whole bunch of other ones now. Oh, I'll, <laughs> read, I'll read it again. Um, what, what explains the permanence or entrenchment of hierarchy as we move closer to the present? Right. Um, closer to the present. Um, I think one of the, um, the major points that, that David and I want to make in the book is that the answer to that question, insofar as we have one um, at the moment, um, is that people have been looking in the wrong place, essentially. People have been looking for answers to that question very much on, on the large scale of evolutionary processes crashing about above the heads of ordinary individuals. Actually, one thing that we found is that the most insidious and entrenched forms of inequality uh, seem to take root on the small scale in households, in families, and then they grow out from there and often attach themselves to much larger organizations. So one of the things we'll be arguing there is that it's, it's really to that, that level of relationships, relationships of gender, relationships between uh, the old and the young, uh, domestic servitude, even slavery. Um, these are the kind of areas we end up focusing on um, and finding that there, in fact, um, is, is where things uh, start to go wrong, assuming that you don't enjoy being dominated in various ways. Um, but, you know, there's also a more optimistic point there, I think, which is that if those things are rooted in small scale relations, it implies that uh, we do actually have perhaps a bit more of a say um, in what happens next, uh, as opposed to thinking that the kind of radical inequality that we undoubtedly experience today is rather the project product of thousands of years, sort of inevitable result of simply living in large complex societies. So that, that's a rather general answer, um, but I, I hope it is some sort of answer. I'm afraid your sound. Time is done, uh, David. So thank you so much for this. It was uh, short, but I feel like we could go, honestly go on talking about this for an hour or something more. So I look forward to some time to talk with you more about this. I'd suggest to everyone listening, go and check out David's writings. It's, uh, they're all absolutely fascinating and you'll learn a great deal. Um, thank you very much. I will be back in Jan uh, January um, with some more food for thought um, in mid-January. So thank you very much uh, and goodbye. Thank you very much, David. Cheers, Andre.